Hi friends and good morning and welcome to Rhythm. This, this morning is our third message in our Extraordinary series. And if you've missed the first two, don't worry. You can find them right here on our YouTube channel. But I hope you are blessed this morning as we discover and live into the extraordinary moments that God makes possible. Welcome to Rhythm. Scripture is full of extraordinary moments, moments that break time in half, where things are described as happening before the extraordinary moment or after the extraordinary moment. And these extraordinary moments can happen to the whole community, like in Pentecost in Acts 2 or in uh, the Exodus when they finally make their way out of Egypt, or they can happen to individuals, to men and women like Moses in the burning bush or Zacchaeus in the tree or Mary when the angel announces that she will be the mother of God. These extraordinary moments are sprinkled throughout scripture. And I would go so far as to say as your life has had some extraordinary moments in them. I know that uh, for me, like the birth of my children and believe it or not, changing my first diaper was an extraordinary moment, maybe not for all the good reasons, but um, it was still an extraordinary moment. I think we arrive at extraordinary moments in different ways. Some of us arrive at extraordinary moments through discovery. We experience something new or we learn something new and that discovery becomes a catalyst for change. Maybe we arrive at them through discovery or discomfort we feel pain, either our own or we empathetically feel someone else's pain. And as a result of that pain, that pain becomes a catalyst for change. This is maybe the pain that Paul feels in Scripture or the, uh, uh, the Good Samaritan who helps the man who's injured on the side of the road. Whether it's discomfort or discovery, they lead to dissonance, uh, a sense of that something is not right here, that something has to change. Whether it's um, through the, the goodness of discovery or the pain of discomfort, the, the dissonance that we sometimes find ourselves in means that we have to change. We can't go back. The, the way things are right now is just quite simply not good enough. That is dissonance. And that dissonance demands a new direction. And so within the dissonance, there is there's opportunity. Within the dissonance, within the, the not rightness, when we encounter brokenness in the world or in ourselves, we have opportunity. God loves us. God is with us. And because of those two things, new things, new life, new opportunity, transformation is possible. And most of the extraordinary moments in Scripture happen through that process, through um, discovery, through discomfort that lead to dissonance, and then ultimately demand a new direction. And maybe one of the clearest examples of that is, um, is in the Old Testament, in the story of a woman named Esther. Now, to give you a little bit of background, um, Esther takes place, Esther's book takes place, when the Israelites find themselves as refugees. They find themselves um, not living in their land and not living under their king. They, they are living in exile. And so they are simply trying to survive as a minority population um, in a different land. And, and, and this land has a king, and the king is not an Israelite. The king is not necessarily sympathetic to the Israelites. And the king, as the story of Esther reveals, is not necessarily the most stable guy either. In fact, as the pages of Esther open, the king is 
hosting a party. And at the party, he invites the queen to come and essentially put her beauty on display for the king and his guests. But the queen refuses. And the king, as a result, relieves her of her queenly duties. He removes the title of queen from her. And so the king can't be without a queen. And so he essentially hosts the Old Testament version of The Bachelor in order to find a new queen. He um, invites all of the women in the kingdom to come and to, uh, to dress up, to present themselves to him, and then he will choose among them who will be the next queen. And here's the moment where Esther, a young Israelite woman, a young Jew, presents herself to the king and is chosen. She, um, he, she, she gets to be queen, and it, it's, it's almost like the king says, will you not, will you accept this rose, but will you accept this crown? And Esther becomes the queen. Now, it would be easy to assume that this is the extraordinary moment of Esther's life, but it's not. Esther soon after she becomes queen, discovers a plot, a genocidal plot to rid the kingdom of Jews, to kill every single Jew in the kingdom. And Esther, all of a sudden, has a pretty significant decision to make. She has found herself not in the lap of luxury, but in the dissonance. She finds herself not knowing what to do. And a good portion of the book of Esther is Esther trying to navigate the dissonance. What do I do? What do I do? Do I tell the king that this is happening? Do I reveal that one of the king's trusted advisor, a man named Haman, has plotted to kill all of these people? Do I reveal that to the king in hopes that he will do something about it because he can? Or do I, as Esther, remain quiet and hope that I survive the coming genocide? You can feel, you can sense the dissonance here. Esther recognizes that if she presents herself to the king in the wrong way, the king could potentially kill her. And yet, her uncle, a man named Mordecai, is trying to convince her to intervene so that the genocide is averted. And as Esther is wrestling with what to do, the plot to kill the Jews, to commit genocide against the Israelites, continues to further. And so as the plot furthers, Mordecai, Esther's uncle, um, is, is almost in a panic, saying to Esther, please, please, you have to do something. And it culminates here in verse 14 of chapter 4. Mordecai says to Esther, verse 14, For if you remain silent at this time, if you don't do anything in this moment, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And then this line, one of the most powerful verses in Scripture, one that just captures the moment, it captures the dissonance, it captures the opportunity. This is what Mordecai says. And who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai says to Esther, who knows? Maybe God has put you here for a reason. And maybe that reason is this opportunity to intervene, to save lives, to do something. Well, fast forward, Esther does intervene. She bravely talks to the king, and the king puts a stop to the potential genocide 
and rescues the Israelites. But that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen if Esther remains silent. Esther found her, lived into her extraordinary moment. She took advantage of this extraordinary opportunity, the extraordinary opportunity within the dissonance. My friends, you have experienced and you are experiencing the dissonance of 2020. You're experiencing the discomfort of not being able to do what you want to do. We are all experiencing the dissonance, the discomfort, the desire to get back to normal. But in the dissonance, there is opportunity. I am reminded at key moments in history, not just in these pages, but throughout world history, it is young people that show us the way. It is young people that lead us out of the dissonance and into the extraordinary. It is young people who remind us of the possibilities and the potential. It's young people who remind us what can be. And so my friends, that is your opportunity in the midst of the dissonance to not um, find rest in the dissonance, but find the opportunity in the dissonance to remind yourself, to remind everyone, to remind our community what can be, to remind our community what is possible when you, like Esther, bravely intervene. When you, like Esther, sacrifice yourself. When you, like Esther, live and love sacrificially. This this is your extraordinary moment. 2021 is your extraordinary moment. What will you do with it?